now we'll move on to interesting topic called torsion. In your advanced mechanics of materials, are you covering torsion? I'm sure you are. Yes or no? But you are being subject to torsion while studying. <laughs> Okay. So torsion, pure torsion rarely occurs. Torsion always occurs in combination with bending and shear. I gave you the example of uh, a spring. Cross section in a spring is subjected to torsional moment, bending moment, shear force, action force. <coughs> If you take any element in a space frame, how many stress resultants can you possibly have? The other day we were required to proof check the design of a freestanding helical staircase. Did I mention about it? So they didn't know how to do it. So we said very simple, treat it as a beam and model it with the appropriate boundary condition. There's a space frame element. <coughs> but so let's say you have an element in space. How many stress resultants will you can you possibly have? Which means, if you cut a section, what do you see in the free body? Okay, let's talk first in terms of vectors. Vectorially, how many will you have? Cut a section, what all can you have? At the centroid axis, you can have one resultant force and one resultant moment. Simple, yeah. Can't be simpler than that. One resultant force and one resultant moment, yes or no? That resultant force you can <coughs> resolve into three components. Each has a separate sense of structural action. What are the three components you can have? Huh? One actual force, it could be tension or compression, and shear. how many shear forces? <laughs> Two shear forces. Actually, one tangential force, which can again resolve into two normal directions. Let's say you have a rectangular cross section uh, in the two principal axes directions, right? Similarly, the moment vector you can resolve into three components with a double arrow, remember? So the double arrow along the longitudinal axis will be your torsion. When you say torsion, what do you mean? So we use these words torsion, torque, twisting moment, angle of twist. What is torsion? Torsion is a word like bending. Torsion is a word like bending. Do you understand? So, you have to be more specific. Twisting moment and torque, what's the difference? Torque and twisting moment. Both have units of moment, kilonewton meter. What's the difference? Torque is the cause and uh, twisting moment is the effect. Okay. Torque is what you normally refer to as an external load. Hmm? Let's say you turn a screwdriver, so you apply a torque. That torque you apply could be concentrated, could be distributed. So we reserve the term torque normally. Of course, you, you know, in a loose way you can say anything. To an external moment applied as a load, as he rightly said, to a cause. But when you talk of an internal moment, then 
if it is corresponding to the double arrow pointing along the longitudinal axis of your member, you use a, a word called twisting moment. Is it clear? So here we'll talk of twisting moments. And that moment vector which can point in any arbitrary direction can be resolved in the tangential direction, that means <coughs> along the plane of the cross section, again into two, two moment components. <coughs> Those moments are called bending moments. How do you get two bending moments? Give an example. Give an example of two shears, two bending moments. What's all this? Maybe we don't have a slide showing all that, but this is common sense. Give an example. Let's talk in terms of skeletal elements, beams. When you have two bending moments, that kind of bending is called <coughs> biaxial bending. Biaxial bending. Right? A corner column in a building. Typically it has, it resists an actual compression. The load transmitted from both the beams in the two orthogonal directions. And because of the frame action, it has two bending moments. One in one plane and the other in the perpendicular plane. So you understand. <coughs> so, strictly you would call that element not a column, a beam column. But a horizontal beam also could be subject to biaxial bending if you have load acting this way and load acting this way. And the shear that you get comes from the variation in the bending moment along the length of the beam. So, you will have possibility of two shears. Is it clear? So. Uh, usually everything happens together, but for convenience we take one, one action at a time. So we have looked at pure bending, we have looked at shear in isolation and we briefly talked about the interaction effect. Now we will look at torsion first as though you have pure torsion. When will you get pure torsion? Give an example of pure torsion. That means you have only twisting moment, I don't have bending moment, I don't have actual force, I don't have shear force. Give an example. Tell your structural engineering students. Make, give the easiest example you know. You're a mechanical engineer, give me a mechanical engineering answer. Quick. Shaft, okay, so they Five talk shaft. always shafts. Crank shaft, what do you do? You are, you are? Pedaling. Pedaling. Simple screwdriver, I told you. Why you want Have you all used a screwdriver? <coughs> yes or no? Yes. Done it. What did you do? You insert the head into the screw, and normally you do this, right? Just rotate it, and the screw turns. Sometimes you apply a little pressure, but you don't need to do that. Once it's turning in the thread, you don't need to apply any force. Of course, uh, nowadays I find carpenters using a hammer to drive a <laughs> screw. <laughs> you should, most carpenters do like that, that's bad carpentry. Nails should be hammered, screws should not be hammered, because it's got a thread. Got it? So, very simple. Okay, so, any question? So the ring beam in the instank, uh, is it a state of action? Okay. Ring beam, ring beam, you said instank, what's an instank? Why not make it simple, ring beam in a water tank? Circular cylindrical water tank, yeah, what's your question? Sir, is it in a state of action bending in both axes? Uh, you tell. Let's make it simple. Circular beam. What's the boundary condition you would like to have for a circular beam? 
simply support it. What are the main requirements of a structure? What's the first requirement? What's the first requirement in structural design? Stability. Stability, yeah. You put simply support it, it will fall down. You will go to Tihar jail. If somebody dies, yes or no? Usually the designer will blame the contractor, contractor will blame the designer. And the newspapers will report that's because poor quality materials were used as usual by the company. They don't know that the designer gave a simply supported condition and equilibrium was lost because the loading is eccentric. Right? It will topple over. Come on, yeah. Yes or no? So, if you want to make it stand. First, you have to make it stand. Then we'll apply loads on it. What should you do? Let's say... I want, uh, your uncle wants a fancy entrance to his palatial house. Someone told him that uh, semicircular arch in plan he wants. Nice shape like that. Can you imagine? He says, do it and make it stand. What will you do? See, portal you can do. Because you studied in, in all these textbooks teach you portal fit. He says, I want a portal where the beam is curved in plan semicircle. Can you make, can you design? That's your assignment problem. <laughs> is it clear? I got a column here and turns like that and goes down like that. How to, first how to make the damn thing stand. So making these uh, corrections has yeah, so we'll make it monolithic, right? So you have a rigid joint. What's the meaning of a rigid joint? You only created all this discussion. What's the meaning of a rigid joint? It's uh, all the bending moment will be transferred. It won't be. First of all, the definition of rigid joint is it talking of bending moments? Not lengthy bending. Rigid joint, spinned joint. You heard these words. They are idealized conditions. They are referring to bending moments or referring to something else? What's the definition of a joint? Sorry, we are going back to A, B, C, D. What's a joint? A connection. Give an example of a joint, which we can all see. Your hand. This joint. What is this joint? Elbow joint. Pin joint or rigid joint? Pin joint. What does it mean? Free relative rotation between the two connecting members is possible, but the joint will connect these two members so that translations are the same at that location. So it's a, it's a kinematic definition which has static consequences. The static consequences, if you allow free rotation, bending moment cannot be transmitted from one member to the other member. But because they are connected actually, actual force can be transmitted, shear force can be transmitted. This is the fundamental definition. Let's say you break your hand, not you, I mean. <laughs> someone outside this room, breaks his hand. Now we are all comfortable. <laughs> what happens then? Let's say a monkey breaks its hand. <laughs> what will happen when the monkey breaks its hand? You won't take it to the hospital. It survives happily. What happens? So when the hand is broken, it's temporarily fractured, dislocated. Nature heals a joint, yes or no? And makes it into a rigid joint. So, even if I have not broken my hand, every point in my skeletal element is a rigid joint. And if it breaks, I want to weld it in such a way it, it re regains its rigidity. Now tell me, this joint, because you cast the beam monolithically with the column, 
is a rigid joint. What's the definition of the rigid joint? There's no relative. No relative. <coughs> but the joint as a whole can rotate and twist. So that's where people get confused. The joint as a whole can rotate, but relative rotation. Okay. So first, tell me, let's say we have no time. You have no paper, no book to refer to. And you have to quickly tell him what to do. The guy has to dig a pit, foundation. What will you do? How will you make the damn thing stand? Now we are talking practical age. See, you, what do you want at that base of the column? What do you want? It's called fixity. So, in what all directions you want fixity? I told you column is like this, like this, the B, like that. Here, what movements you want to arrest? You don't want it to fall down this way. So, you want to arrest movement to this. Then, so it can fall down this way. In all the directions. All the directions. How to make it? Which is the worst? Which are you most worried about? Stability way. This way. Right? So you blundered here by saying simply support condition. No, you not only want rigidity there, you want rigidity at the base. How to make it stand? How to make it stand? What should I do? Shall I give a symmetric footing? I want to save money also. That's why I come to MTech structures from IIT Madras. Give me the cheapest foundation. What will you do? Put one more uh, semicircular. The same thing that is above. Uh, that same Uncle says, I don't want the ants to see it. I want people visiting my house to see it. <laughs> Why you want me to waste so much money below? So the and the reaction becomes concentrated. Something like that. Foundation with it. This suggestion is good. So I don't need to give any foundation. Are you saying that? <coughs> Sir, why waste money on foundation? Simply make something like this and like this, take it and put it there on the ground, it will stand. Agreed? <laughs> you are saying don't give foundation at all. <laughs> now you are saying, no, no, my teachers taught me. Why do you give foundation? Why do you give foundation to a column? Professor Gandhi gave you a talk on foundation, no? Why do you need a foundation? See, he's saying, first he said this, I thought it's a brilliant idea. Now he's saying, no, 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 I also so want I a foundation. The foundation should be somewhat like you want everything. You want foundation plus one more. So the footing should be uh, somewhat like that, so that the uh, reaction between the ground. You want a footing like that. Eh? Putting of this. <laughs> so he is saying that the footing will be more costly than the super. <laughs> yeah, but that's a different thing. What you said is good because we can visualize, you can carry it around, no? You can. I can take it and put it here. Yes or no? Why do I need a foundation? Wait. You must have the courage to give the correct answer. Do I need a foundation or not? <coughs> if I do what you say, uh, you getting into trouble. You only gave an ingenious solution, but now you are backing out and wasting my money and time. Make a model of it. Very nice. What he is saying is good. But you also want a foundation. You want it to go below ground also. Too expensive. That means you want to share all that. So think about it. Giving more moment of in that direction. Right. So you can, you don't need to go all the way, you can actually just have an L shaped. That's enough to prevent. You don't need to complete the whole circle. Why waste money? Okay, think about it. these are very practical issues and you must know how to design them, how to calculate, how to take care of torsion, how to take care of uh, fixity. Is it clear? Okay. <coughs>
what's this question? This question is what's this question? Ring ring. Ah, you forgot <laughs> your question. No, no, no. Let's take. The, I'll see, make it simple. This now we'll do what he's saying. This double C we have got with this two particles. Okay. Is this beam? Let's take self weight only. Don't put one tank and all on top. I recently uh, bought one, changed my aqua guard, and the guys did this similar thing. They did. They put a platform and they put one huge tank on top, and they supported it on just nails. One nail there, one nail there, one nail there, one nail. I immediately thought of asking B Tech students to calculate the force in the nail. Because you got a lever arm, you got the weight, you can easily do it. Okay, but that's clever. You see, carpenters are, they have ingenuity. They know from sheer, sheer failures in the past how much force to apply and which screw to put. They also know what size of screw to apply. Okay, a curved beam subject to self weight. Don't say simply support conditions. So you should say with boundary conditions which arrest the twisting moment generated. So that degree of freedom is arrested. Will you have twisting moment? Curved beam, curved in plan. One of your assignment problems will be that. I'll give you a circular tank to make you happy. Will it be subject to torsion or not? You have some doubt? Why will it be something? To maintain equilibrium. Yeah. If I take a section somewhere, yeah. so there will be a force in one plane and then the shear, external force will be in one plane and the shear will be in another plane. Oh, so, so. Gravity load only. Ah, okay. Uh, the shear at the section will be. The, the section gravity itself. load will uh, be out of the to understand. So you have to think. So torsion, you have to think 3D. Beam, you can think 1D, 2D. Torsion, you have to think 3D. So we'll come to that. In the next topic, we'll understand it a little bit. Torsion, flexure, shear interaction, fairly complex due to the non-homogeneous, non-linear and composite nature of the material and the presence of crack. Flexure, shear itself is complicated. Now we're adding to the complexity by bringing in torsion also. Code methods of design and judicious blend of theoretical consideration of the experiment. What is the difference? The standard question, gate question, which you've all passed with flying colors. What is, have you heard this word? Equilibrium torsion, compatibility torsion. <coughs> Sometimes called primary torsion and secondary torsion. What's the difference? Actually, only RC designers use these words equilibrium and compatibility. What's the difference? Someone answer. Okay. No, no. Uh, you can answer. I want some fresh answers from the bank, from people who have not answered today. Let me ask you a tricky question. That means in equilibrium torsion, compatibility need not be satisfied, and in compatibility torsion, equilibrium need not be satisfied. Does that mean? No, I'm troubling you. How these words came? Equilibrium torsion, compatibility. Equilibrium torsion should be there. I mean, otherwise, the structure won't be stable. Equilibrium torsion should be always there in all structures? No, no. If I am, say... Uh, say it more correctly. Equilibrium always has to be satisfied. Yes. Don't add torsion. Equilibrium has to be satisfied. Compulsory. You have no choice. Compatibility? Need not be satisfied? Need not be satisfied? I want to know what you are trying to say. No, it has to be satisfied. Now but both have to be satisfied. I mean, uh, let's, if I uh, take a cantilever beam okay. and try to support it on another beam, if there is no uh, way that I can put a column there. Okay. So Prop cantilever. Uh, no. Not a prop cantilever, but a cantilever. 
Tell me. I, I'm not different. No, no, let's hear your story. Yeah. I have a cantilever beam. Okay. I'm trying to support it on another. Why do you want to support it? See, a situation arises, something like You want to support the cantilever is a parent, it doesn't need any support. Fix support. Uh -huh. Oh, you don't want to fix it. I want to fix it on a beam. Not a, I, I am then it won't be fixed. Mm -hmm. Then you're getting a rigid joint. You're not getting fixed in there. That will rotate. No, no but uh, there, uh, the relative uh, rotation uh, rotation angle is different. Oh, let, let me give what this time. I have a simply supported beam. In the middle of the beam, I have another beam sticking out perpendicular, mm -hmm. which is a cantilever. But it's not fixed. Okay, and I can put a constant load here, right? So what are you trying to say? So torsion will, uh, must be developed at the uh, mid-span of the simply supported beam. Torsion must be developed only at the mid-span? No, no, I mean throughout the, throughout the uh, simply supported beam, which, should, which is maximum at the mid-span. So if you have torsion, can a simple support work? Simply supported beam, can it resist a torque in the middle? So then the boundary conditions are not the same. Now we are getting into interesting terrain. So be very clear. Anyway, let me trouble you with a fundamental question in structural analysis. You heard of statically determined structures and statically indeterminate structures? What's the difference? <coughs> What's the difference between a statically determined structure and a statically indeterminate structure? How did these names come? By using statically, structures are not statically determinate or indeterminate. It's human beings who have to analyze the structure who are in trouble. That's why they gave these names. This is easy to analyze, determinate. What is determinate? The internal forces, the support reaction. The force response is determinable by applying simple equations of equilibrium, of static equilibrium. Indeterminate, statically indeterminate means not easy to apply. It's indeterminate, I don't know. So I need additional equations. The number of unknowns exceed my available equations of equilibrium. I need additional equations and those equations are called compatibility equations. Right? So I have to explicitly identify and solve those compatibility equations to get my unknown forces, which are called redundancy. Agreed? Now, I don't need to do that with statically determinate systems. Does it mean that when I solve the equilibrium equations, compatibility is also being solved simultaneously? without my knowledge. I'm asking you a deep question. Is it being automatically solved? Huh? Can you prove it? Can you prove it mathematically? You can. So please read my book on advanced structural analysis. There is a contra-graded principle where you can prove this by using the, invoking the principle of virtual work. Very interesting. We don't have time to get into that, but that's fundamental. Is it clear? Okay. So give me an example of equilibrium torsion and give me an example of compatibility torsion so everybody understands. Like a portal frame is there. Portal frame is there. Slab is there. Slab is sticking out from the beam. Then the loading is at on the edge of this that slab. Loading is, uh, yeah, make it simple, your, your lintel sunshade, right? So, so that loading will cause the primary torsion in the inductor, in beam the beam of the beam. And can you find the twisting moments in the beam? So you're right, all you should, if you can find the twisting moments in your beam or frame element, by simply applying equation of equilibrium, you've got equilibrium torsion. Got it? By taking free bodies, applying equation of equilibrium, 
if you can get and you have to design for that torsion, no escape from that. Because equilibrium always has to be set. Very easy to understand. That means you are dealing with a statically determined system. What is compatibility torsion? It's statically indeterminate, so you have to invoke compatibility. Give an example of that. Secondary means supported on. Secondary beam supported on a primary beam, what happens? How is the torsion induced? At the junction, the bending moment, the hogging moment or whatever in the secondary beam will be equal to the no will be equal to the torque. And now you should use correct language, yeah? Twisting moment in the other beam is varying along the length of it. It's a torque in the free body of the other beam. Got it? Because it's acting perpendicular. But there's something more to it. How do you get that twisting moment? What do you now need to look at? So what is the property you have to now start looking at? Huh? Correct word you should say <coughs> to uh, to <coughs> apply compatibility. What do you need to understand? What is the key thing which dictates how much twisting, how much torque there will be? What's the key thing in statically indeterminate systems? You have to start beginning to look at relative stiffnesses. You have to look at the torsional stiffness of one beam and flexural stiffness of the perpendicular beam. In equilibrium torsion, you didn't give a damn what the stiffness is well. Because from equilibrium you could get it. These are crucial differences. Is it possible that at the end of the day the twisting moment is zero? Let me put it this way. You've got a slab. You've got primary beams running between columns, framed. You want to run a secondary beam to reduce the span of the slab. That secondary beam is going to rest on a primary beam. Yes or no? Many practicing engineers design that secondary beam as simply supported. And the code allows them also. Is it justified? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's integrally connected. If it's simply sitting on top, then it's a fair thing. But it's integrally connected. Cast together. If the concrete breaks, will it crack? If I design it that way, that after cracking, it will not. No, 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 no. Will it crack or not? It will crack. Then what happens when it cracks? No, you designed as a framed structure. You are saying whether or not it cracks depends on how I design it? Huh? Let's say I design it as though it will not rotate at all. Fixed beam. The secondary beam I design as a fixed beam. So I am putting lot of steel inside. Will it crack or not? Does the stiffness of a beam depend on the reinforcement you put inside? Does the flexural stiffness in a beam increase if you add some bars in it? It does increase but very little. The stiffness in the beam is primarily governed by the Why? It's E I by L related, no? E of concrete. Why E of concrete, not E of steel? Because percentage of steel is negligible. L is of the beam. I is of the concrete. Well, you can take the transform section, but once it cracks, even that is... So concrete really is the boss here, yeah? You guys from 
structures division wake up this is when concrete is the boss you better treat the boss as boss your steel doesn't come into play yes or no steel can come to rescue to take care of tension but sorry the stiffness of the beam is governed by the size of the beam and the span of so even if you put hajar reinforcement in your beam if your beam is torsionally not stiff it's going to crack whether you like it or not okay so we look into those aspects <coughs> equilibrium or primary torsion is associated with twisting moments that are developed <coughs> to maintain static equilibrium with eccentrically applied external <coughs> loads and are independent of the torsion stiffness of the member got it independent you can make it very stiff or make it very shallow doesn't care the twisting moments are entirely determinable from statics alone from statics means equilibrium equation of static okay to which scientists should we do we owe the equation of static equilibrium name it name isaac newton isaac newton prove the body is continuously in the state of rest huh? a state of newton's law what is newton's law body newton's law actually introduces equilibrium please read that so you should understand the equation of equilibrium there is no resultant force or moment then the body is in equilibrium okay so we'll take the example he, did you read the book some other book already knew this is correct uh, this for example your cycle stand here in iit is like that you have a shed you have concrete cantilever roof you have a beam here you have two columns here they are fixed in the base foundation is better designed properly then if you isolate the beam <coughs> you will find that this load with whose cg is along this line is eccentric to the center line of the beam right and you can calculate this it's a weight of that beam into the eccentricity that is distributed uniformly along the length of the beam it's a distributed torque let's say the total torque is t then equilibrium demands that either you arrest it at one end fully like in a shaft or equally on both sides and so this t has to be if it's clockwise here it has to be resisted by two anti clockwise moments at the two ends t by 2 t by 2 got it simple equilibrium and of course the vertical load you'll have this thing and then you'll have some hogging moment here due to the fixity this you can analyze as a portal frame got it you don't need to analyze a portal frame to find t by 2 t by 2 t by 2 is statically determinate it only depends on the weight and the eccentricity got right? it and if you cut a section anyway the twisting moment will vary like this agree you can have a concentrated load let's say i have a beam like that then this diagram will be constant and then switch back so the shape of this diagram <coughs> depends on whether the torque applied is concentrated or this this is equilibrium torsion clear primary torsion you have to design for it otherwise you will have a stability issue your building will collapse may you know especially car porches in conventional masonry buildings good engineers will look for back span so some counterweight should be there otherwise this thing will topple over the beam is so behind second retorsion this is the name given to the type of torsion wherein the twisting moments are statically indeterminate and caused by rotations applied at one or more points along the length of the member the magnitude of the twisting moments depends on the torsional stiffness of the member and the flexion stiffness of the other member and the analysis necessarily involves rotational compatibility conditions okay compatibility is automatically satisfied there here you have to explicitly satisfy the torsion stiffness of an rc member is drastically reduced up to 90% by torsion cracking the concrete cracks easily in torsion 
you can look it up. And so, you know torsion stiffness, you can, what's the expression for axial stiffness? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the expression for shear stiffness? G A dash by L. What is the expression for flexural stiffness? E I bell into some constant depending on your condition. What's the expression for torsional stiffness? G J by, huh? by theta. Till now we all said something by L. In the numerator you had say E I by L. E I is called flexural rigidity. It's a product of two property. One is a material property, elastic property called E. The other is a sectional property, uh, moment of inertia, second moment of area called I. Shear rigidity similarly is G A dash. G is a material property related to elastic modulus with your Poisson's ratio. A is a cross-sectional property. Similarly, your axial stiffness E A by L. E is material property A. So, you will find the numerator is called rigidity and numerator divided by L into appropriate constant is called stiffness. Got it? Don't get confused. The rigidity property is a sectional property. The stiffness property is a member property. It's an element property. You understand? You can change your area of cross section in a non prismatic beam, so the, the rigidity value will change along the length. But when you look at the whole thing, you have to integrate and find your overall behavior because you find, want to find deflections, angles of twists and strains and so on. Got it? So you have also something called torsional rigidity and the classic example given is members which are subject to pure torsion. Which kind of members are subject to pure torsion? circular prismatic sections, right? So, when you study strength of material, we'll study torsion in circular beams or annular beams, right? That kind of torsion called same menon torsion, right? You have only torsion shear. And so, if you have a shaft which is fixed at the end and you apply a torque, then you can find the angle of twist and the relationship between the torque and the angle of twist is given by the torsional stiffness which is G J by L as you said. G is the shear modulus, J is the polar moment of inertia. Now if you have a rectangular section, we use the same concept but instead of J we use something called C which is called the torsional constant. You can see that G C by L. Right? Got it? Okay. Now the problem is, and I tell you many companies have uh, their in-house software and I always ask them this question, are you designing for torsion? They said, no sir, someone has set the software in such a way that, that, uh, see, that there is a torsional release given. You know when you do a grid you can release the torsion if you want. Hmm? I said, why did they do that? Sir, we don't know. So read the book because the code allows you to do it and your life becomes simpler, your degree of static indeterminacy drops down and you don't need to explicitly design for secondary torsion. Why? You will see. The reason is torsional stiffness drastically reduces when the moment it cracks and it cracks very easily. Can you give a, a simple example to demonstrate to school children how it cracks? We take a chalk piece and we twist it and we show. What's the nature of that? What's that shape called? Helical, right? So that's the surface you get. This results in a very large angle of twist and in the case of compatible with torsion, a major reduction in the twisting mode. So you can do sophisticated analysis, but at the end of the day, once it cracks, that will drop. But what I recommend to, to many people is don't designed for that residual torsion. So you can put a stiffness modifier in your software. Even in SAP and STAT and all that you can do a modifier. 
And if you really want to do good design, take a modifier, say maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So your design, you are assuming 70, or point, no, sorry, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. That means you are reducing the C value or the GC value by 30%, 40%. That will give you a good, correct design for torsion. For this reason, the code permits the designer to neglect the torsion stiffness of RC members at the structural analysis stage itself so that the need for detailed design for torsion in such cases does not arise at the design stage. You design after you finish analysis. In the analysis, if you get zero twisting moments, forget it. If you get small twisting moments, design for it. Equilibrium torsion you cannot ignore. Compatibility torsion you can judiciously ignore. But even if you ignore the, in the design, in the detailing, you better not ignore because you want to restrict the crank points. So this is the example they gave, very good. You have a secondary beam, you have a primary beam. So when the secondary beam is loaded, this will rotate, you will have hogging moments here. When because this joint is monolithic, the rotation theta b is also the angle of twist theta b in this member. So if you isolate this member, you are actually applying a torque in the middle. And that torque is nothing but the hogging moment you get here. Is it clear? This kind of torsion is called secondary torsion or compatibility torsion. Flexure of beam bd results in a rotation theta b, compatibility of torsion or rotation at b imply that angle of twist is equal to theta. So the why we say compatibility, the other reason is this theta b which is the cause. Because of theta b you are getting twisting moments. The cause is the deformation. These are called deformation induced stresses. Not load induced stresses. They are deformation induced stresses. Can you give me another example of deformation induced stresses? we covered briefly when we looked at shrinkage and temperature. Let's take a building which is subjected to a temperature variation of plus or minus 40 degrees Celsius. So let's say you release all the, you make it statically determinate, release all the redundance, then it can breathe freely, there is no, no movement. If you arrest, then you are asking for trouble, you will have internal stresses. Those are caused by compatibility. Huh? And if, let's say, let's say you have a member and uh, let's say it shrinks, this is subject to tension, you will have to design for a huge tension, we discussed that, but luckily for you the concrete cracks. <coughs> when it cracks, part of that tension is released. But you must be able to guess how much. So we normally said this, assume 50% is released. And you design your reinforcement for that 50%. This is another example of, you can say, compatibility tension here. Or it is deformation induced stress, not load induced stress. Is it clear? This is also a case of deformation induced stress. The magnitude of theta b and T b equal to m b depend on the torsional stiffness of ABC and the flexural stiffness of ABC, the torsional stiffness of this which is very poor, once it cracks, flexural stiffness of this which could be high. The total stiffness of this joint is the sum of this plus this, you know that. Corresponding to theta B, a twisting moment TB will develop in the beam ABC and an equal and opposite bending moment AB will develop in theta B. The, the torque that you get here is simply the torsional stiffness of this beam into theta b. But if the torsional stiffness degrades, then the resulting torque will also degrade. Okay, torsion causes shear. But pure torsion, you have only shear. How does torsion cause shear? Can you give an example which is easy to understand? Which those of us who take bath every day in the morning know it to be true. What do you do with your bath towel to, to dry it? What do you do? You twist it. Why do you twist it? Why do you twist it? To squeeze out the water. How does the water get squeezed out? By? 
Now we talk in terms of shear. Okay. So these are very nice experiments to teach uh, to beginners. Let's take a cylindrical specimen and let mark these colorful lines: red color in the longitudinal direction and green color in the circumferential direction. So you got nice grids. Let's say they look square. Then let's say it's a shaft. You fix this end and you twist this end, okay, like this, or you can twist both ends, right? Then ask people to note the shape that the, the shape that you get after you do this so tell me what do you see here what's so special about this shape can someone tell me what's so special about that shape uh, tell clearly you tell me in terms of green and red green and red Green and red, don't say one side. No. What happens to the green? What happens to the red? Green remains same. Green remains same. I mean, it remains green. <laughs> what happens to the green? Huh? The green simply rotates. That means a point here once it will move outward at these two ends, right? That, let's say the same. The green would have moved in the circumferential direction, but the green will remain in the same plane. That's the beauty of this. When do you expect the green to go out of plane? What is that called? That's called warping. That's called longitudinal warping. In the longitudinal direction, it goes out of plane. Is it clear? But in Pure torsion, circular beam, it doesn't go out of plane, it remains in that plane. That's the first point you have to note. And you can actually note it experimentally. Say, so, yeah, look, the, the circle remains a circle. The plane section remains. Green finished. So, but the green goes through an angle of twist. So, if you mark a point here, A, that A would have gone some angle, that angle is called angle of twist. Got it? What about the red? What's the shape of the red? Red takes a stretch. What's the shape? Red shape, if you have to ask you, what is the shape? What is the curve? What's the shape of that curve? That takes the shape of a helix. But over a short distance, it can be straight. Now, if you take this small piece, and you will see that what is happening is one side, one diagonal gets elongated, another side gets contracted. Got it? So when you squeeze the towel, it's the diagonal which gets contracted that squeezes the water outside of your towel. We understood. And this condition is called pure shear. These are the principal directions and tangentially you have shear. So all, if you have equal compression and tension, then it means in the other direction you have pure shear. So uniform torsion in a prismatic circular element with freedom to warp in any section your plane section remain plane, no warping circular section remains circular, no distortion. When will you, so you have many possibilities. You can have warping without distortion, you can have distortion without warping. When will you have what? Can you tell me? Let's say I have a prismatic beam, what happens? Let's say I have a non-circular beam, what happens? Since torsion, so Mario Salvadori, see, structure in the very famous book. Since torsion develops shear stress, it must be equivalent to tension and compression at right angles. The housewife, look at the language he's used. Very few engineers can write like this. Okay, I really know. The housewife who wrings the wet rag before hanging it proves this to be true. This is how you should learn engineering. You have to be a housewife. The torsion induced 
compression squeezes the water out of the rack. But even in those days, he's thinking only housewives squeeze the towel. <laughs> Men don't have to do anything. Amazing <laughs> guys. Huh? Rag. Huh? Towel is different from rag. <laughs> okay, so you're familiar with the torsion formula. It's just like the flexion formula. So when you have a prismatic circular member, you have no warping, no torsion. When you have a prismatic non-circular member and you subject it to a torque, you'll have warping, but you won't have distortion. If you have non-prismatic circular member, you'll have distortion without <coughs> warping, for example, a square member. And if you have a non-prismatic non-circular member, you'll have both distortion. Okay. Non-uniform torsion or restraint against warping, this kind of stresses are called warping stresses. Now, <coughs> where is the, let's take a pure solid, a cylindrical beam, yeah. What is distortion? Distortion is, is what? Anybody? Change in shape. If the circle remains a circle, no distortion. If the circle becomes an ellipse, it cracks because of torsion. After? After the beam cracks because of torsion. After the beam cracks because of torsion. Would it affect the flexural stiffness? You are saying, will a degradation in torsional stiffness affect flexural stiffness? Yes, possibly. Because torsion and flexion are strongly interrelated. There will be. Uh, and so you have, you have to be careful. Sometimes your bending movements are statically determined. Then it doesn't make a difference. You understand what I'm saying? If bending movements are statically determined, then your bending moment diagram is fixed. It doesn't depend on the stiffness, flexural stiffness. Otherwise, there will be an effect. But it's a very funny effect because it's not a direct effect. If your torsional stiffness degrades, it doesn't degrade your flexional stiffness to any, anywhere close to that extent, to some extent. <coughs> so please understand this. Now I want to ask you a, a tricky question. We say you, de you get shear stresses developed. Where is the maximum shear stress in a cylindrical specimen? Which location? I have a cylinder. I have a pipe. Huh? At the surface. Hmm? At the center? How does it vary? All of you are clear? Let's now replace this with a square. Hmm? I have a square <coughs> shaft. I apply the same torque. Where will you get the maximum shear stress? The corners. At the corners. Surprise. At the corners, the shear stress is zero. <laughs> At the corners, the shear stress is zero. You fell neatly into the trap I laid for you. <laughs> now the next question is, why is it zero? For a rectangle also at the corner, though the radial distance is maximum and your logic intuitively says it should be, it's actually zero then. So let's answer. Huh? This is how you should learn torsion. Yeah. Did you know that? At the corner, it's zero. It's a rigid body rotation only at the corner. So, rigid body rotation only at the corner. I don't understand your language. It's a rigid rotation. Rigid rotation. Is there a flexible rotation? Unless there is no deformation, it's still not over. In a circular member? It's all or uniform. So, everywhere it will be deformed. Here, it doesn't rotate. What are you saying? What is rigid rotation? It's 
like a translation is a bigit moon there is no relative if you drew the same red and green lines on the square section what would be the shape remember that experiment red line green line green line is perpendicular to the on the surface perpendicular to the longitudinal axis and red lines are along the longitudinal axis parallel lines what happens to a square section if you rotate what happens what thing will take place? will it happen also at the corner yes so you have to understand <coughs> if you take a circular section you will find that you have a shear flow like this and if you rotate it like this you will have this movement also like that and you can see that you can see that the maximum shear stress will be at the periphery and if you have a stress here you'll have to have a stress there and this will generate a complementary shear normal to it like that got it at least all of us should understand this is how shear is generated and your angle of twist can be worked out like that no complementary shear stress component on the free surface abcp is not this outside surface is free the complementary shear gets generated inside not outside got it but if you have a non circular section and you do the same thing you will find that the there is a complementary shear component because of this angle normal which is not possible in circular only you can prove it, it won't happen in here you will get a, a thing which which is not possible similarly at the corner here you if you try to draw draw the complementary shear you will you will be forced to draw a complementary shear on the free surface which is not possible so for tau equal to zero at the corner, the upper face of the cross section must also rotate by gamma to maintain 90 degrees. So this is probably what you meant by rigid rotation. I wanted you to explain what do you mean by rigid rotation. So the original plane cross section becomes warped longitudinally. Please read this. You will have to think a lot and understand a lot to figure out why at the corners you will not get rotations. Now if you have the red lines and the green lines, you will find that. The, the red, I think I changed the red line in green. Yeah? I don't know. So uh, it goes out of plane. Goes out of plane. Okay. So I am not here to teach you the mathematics of this. You are going to learn it in. If you have not already studied it, advanced mechanics of. I will give you simple tips of how to visualize the shear stresses. So there is something called same minutes theory of torsion. Please go through this. I am not going to. Earlier I used to teach advanced mechanics. Uh, in the, we used to have a special course for TCS called M-Tech in Computational Mechanics. So we did all this, but now I don't. So I, I am not going to get too into stress function or that. This is just some old key notes. You will we'll study this on your own. <clears throat> but there's one nice analogy I want you to know. Okay. Prandtl's membrane analogy. What's his membrane analogy? Have you heard of this? So he gave a simple experimental device on how to do that. Let's say you have an arbitrary shape, elliptical shape or rectangular shape. He said, imagine, and you are twisting that beam, pure top. He says, just stick a membrane onto the, let's say it's hollow. You stick a membrane onto the open end of that membrane, of that section, and fill air inside and take, look at the shape of the membrane after it bulges out. You can visualize that? Can you visualize that? So let's say you have a circular member. What should be the shape of the, the membrane when you blow air into it? 
and experimentally they did it and you could prove hemisphere now well it will be a dome shape and he gave some simple thumb rules which you can mathematically prove I won't get into the proof the proof is this the slope of the membrane will give you a direct measure of the shear stress you can actually do it the slope so imagine the dome the slopes are maximum at the outer periphery and zero at the center beautiful now imagine you've got a square or rectangular section and you imagine the shape and you blow air through it that membrane will again at the corners will have zero slope at the corners very interesting so I want you this analogy is so beautiful to remember it gives you a rough idea of the distribution of shear stress. Just mentally blow air into it and see the shear. This other things I'll skip. I, I, I you know, can go through it. You can work it. Okay, there's a proof of this. We will skip. Now let's look at a narrow rectangular section. Narrow rectangular section. So if you blow air into it. It will take contours like this, can you guess? So if you take a section like this, it will blow up like that, you will have maximum here. If you take a section like this, it will take a shape like this, this part will be almost straight, right? No pain. Now, <coughs> this is your variation of shear. So what you will find is the shear stress is more or less constant throughout the length. Okay? And you can work out formulas, the, you know, the, the, how you can find out the expression for torsional shear stress. So if the B by T, B is this width, T is the length, is infinity, that means long one-way slab or one-way uh, cross section, long thin narrow rectangular section, you will find that the formula is this tau max is 3t by bt squared and t by theta is 1 third of g bt cubed by l. So this is the measure of torsion stiffness, this is the measure of shear stiffness. You need only two things. You have to find an expression for torsion stiffness and you have to find an expression for shear stress maximum. So this is a standard form. Now, <coughs> we will talk of re-entrant corners. Have you heard of re-entrant corners? What's a re-entrant corner? In buildings, it's a common term. L-shaped? What is a, a re-entrant corner is a dangerous corner from a mechanics point of view. You have stress concentration. So what is a re-entrant corner? So that's interesting. So a re-entrant corner is by definition, if you have solid here and air here, hmm, if you draw two angles, that is this angle and the internal angle, when the solid internal angle is more than the internal angle made by the air, then that's called a re-entrant corner. So you can see clearly that here this is 180 degrees, uh, sorry, 270 degrees and this is 90 degrees. So this is a classic re-entrant corner. And you can imagine, and the, if you blow air inside this cross section, that means you're subjecting the L-shaped section to this thing. What can you imagine? You can imagine that at this corner, corner, the slope is going to be nearly vertical, is it not, the air, the balloon will blow out like that and here it's going to be zero. So these, this is called a dead corner, this is a re-entered corner. Okay. So the, at the re-entered corner you will have very high stresses, high stress concentration and that's why you should avoid these corners. What should you do in these corners, even in mechanical engineering, you should give a fillet. Okay, you should curve this so that you don't get that stress concentration. Okay, 
Now let's also talk of shear flow. I think in the lab you're doing those experiments, no? You have a, a closed tube and you have a tube with a slit. You're doing the test or not? Not yet. Okay, let's imagine. You're going to take, I think it's a it's a PVC pipe or a steel pipe? Mm -hmm. Aluminium. Mm -hmm. PVC pipe, let's say. PVC pipe, which is solid, and PVC pipe with a slit. Apply a torque in both. What's the difference in behavior? In terms of stiffness, let's talk. Which is going to be stronger in stiffness? The solid, the, the pipe without a slit. Pipe with a slit is going to twist a lot, right? Very weak torsion. So now we are looking at what happens when you have a closed box. You know, bridge girders, we prefer a closed box. Box girder bridges. Very efficient in handling torsion. Rather than open sections. So open sections, closed sections. What's the why is a closed section so good in torsion compared to an open section? Can anyone explain? Inside for a distributed section responsible for resist shear is less. So when there is a slit section in the shear flow at the surface, it has to reverse from that slit and the lever arm is reduced. So lever arm is, how is the lever arm reduced? In one leg the Shear is going this way, and then on the other surface it has to come down this way. So the lever arm between these two lines, these two shear flows, becomes only this much. That is almost half the thickness of that member. Whereas uh, if it is a closed member, then it will be like the entire depth of the, of the dimension. Okay, you what he's saying? <coughs> if you have a shape like this, or a shape like this, and you apply a torque, this is going to be the shear flow. Right? If you have a shape like this, the shear flow is such that it has to go back like this. In all these cases, your lever arm is only this little bit. Supposing you close this, what will be the shear flow? Supposing you close this. If you close it, see, uh, let me take, first let me take a solid section and let's say I apply a torque. The shear flow will be, maximum shear stress will be here and here. They say the middle of the longest side, the square, it doesn't matter. And then, it will turn here. Here, of course, corner will be zero. Then you will have inside less shear stress, and less shear stress, less shear stress. Right? Similarly, so let's say I divide it into layers. Each layer has its own path and this outermost layer is going to be the most effective to resist torsion because I have a huge lever arm, lever arm is this much. The innermost layer has hardly any lever arm, so not only is the stress low, the lever arm is also low. The reason why the stress is low is because the lever arm. Have you got it? This is sure. Now to save money, I don't want to waste my material. My material here is inefficiently used, structurally. I'm wasting it. The quality of this material is the same as the quality of this material. So I can save money by providing a hollow section, which is what I will do if I give a annular shape like this, thin malt structure like this. So I save so much of material. Now this is the 
pattern of my shear flow. My Libram is still this much. But the moment I have a slit, I lose this huge benefit because now I have a free surface there. And so this is not going to be valid anymore. It has to take a flow like this. So compare this lever arm with this lever arm. This is nothing. So the, the, the torque capacity itself is negligible compared to the torque capacity. And the stiffness is also very small of this compared. So both in terms of strength and in terms of stiffness, a solid section is far superior to an open section, either this kind of open section or this kind of this kind. This is channel, sorry, this is angle, this is T, this is channel. Okay, so this theory, we just remember torsion stiffness for a circular section is Gj by L. And uh, you have to take care of warping. And so you have two types of torsion. You have Seinman in torsion and warping torsion. And there's a mathematical theory behind this. Remember that the torsional constant can be taken as, as this factor for a rectangular section. And if it's uh, so this is the formula. This is the stiffness is GC by L. But we like to take care to note that concrete cracks after torsion, torsional cracking, and the stiffness degrades. So if you really want to do it more accurately, you have to not take the full G. You should take some fraction of that G. Okay, there's one more theory that is very interesting. It's called the sand heap analogy. Does anyone know about the sand heap? Nada is sand heat analysis, which is something we will look at shortly. So if I take concrete now and subject it to pure torsion, the distribution of shear stresses theoretically will be like this. My maximum will be at the middle, the middle of the longer span. Okay, then it will be slightly less, and at the corner it will be zero. So this diagram we should remember. And it's not a linear variation, it's a non-linear variation. Is it clear? For circular, you know it's going to be linear. For a rectangular section, this is typically how it will be. But then, let's say this is made of a ductile material which is going to yield. So you have elastic behavior and you have plastic behavior. If it's going to yield, you know that yielding can spill over to the entire region and one extreme idea is everything yields. So you have complete plastic behavior here. So your elastic stress transmission like this changes to inelastic like that and then drastically changes to that. This one extreme ideology. idea. It's a concept. The degrees of plastic behavior. Certainly you can't apply this theory to plain concrete because plain concrete is brittle. It won't plastify. But you will get some upper bound value of what's the uh, capacity that you can get for a section like that. So, owing to the brittle behavior of concrete in tension, the crack formed in the periphery when the diagonal stress exceeds and sensing would rapidly penetrate inwards. This effectively destroys the torsional density, which is primarily due to the stress in the outer fibers largest in magnitude and also having the largest lever arm. However, prior to failure, some degree of plastification takes place, especially in the outer layers. So some plastification concrete happens in the outer layers. Inner layers, of course, it's not going to work. So we will stop with this topic, just like you have a cracking moment. What is a cracking moment? It's a moment at first crack. The moment, if you subject the beam to pure bending, at some moment, the modulus of rupture is reached. That moment will cause it to crack. Similarly, you can have a 
cracking torsion, the limiting torsion resistance of a plane torsionally unreinforced concrete section, and you can derive it using classic theory, classic theory, skew bending theory, and tube analysis. The code has actually derived a formula based on classic theory, and it's very easy to understand. Take a rectangular section. Let's apply a pure torque on it. You have a shear stress distribution like what I do. The CG of that stress, let's say somewhere there, somewhere there, somewhere there, somewhere there. The sand heap analogy says if you take sand and you heap it on, on this boundary, let's say you put it on ground and you heap sand, the sand shape will form some kind of a pyramid. Can you imagine? That's how you store grains. It will take a shape of a pyramid. The volume of the pyramid is a function of the total shear and torsion. You can prove it in the expression. But leave aside that volume. If you apply equilibrium, you will find that. Let's say the net shear in the vertical direction is VB. The net shear in the horizontal direction is VH. And let's say that the size of this rectangle is A is, is B. This should be B. B into D. Then if you assume a 45 degree angle here in this analogy, then this will be B by 2 and this will be D minus B. So you can prove that if the torsional shear stress is constant everywhere, mobilized during in the plastic, uh, plastic theory assumption, then it's simply tau T max into the volume. Okay? Or because this is nothing but an area kind, so it's tau T max into the volume in this, but you can work it out uh, that Vb is tau T max into, what is the area? You can work out this area. Vd by 2 is half this distance minus B squared by 4. So it's a total area minus half this triangle. Okay, that's your net area of this trapezium. And so you can work out the lever arm. You can prove that when you multiply all this, you can prove it more easily here. Tau T max, VH is tau T max into B squared by 4, and VB is tau T max into this area. And your net lever arm Z1, Z2 can be worked out using appropriate formula. When you substitute all this and work out a total cracking torque, it comes to this simple form. You can prove this. Tau T max is approximately 0 0.2 root FCK. So this is a very simple way of calculating your cracking torque based on plastic. Easy to derive, you can work it out. And I'll end by showing a graph. We'll stop with this graph. If you measure torque with twist for a rectangular cross section, then you'll find for plain concrete, suddenly you'll have a brittle behavior here. And this angle of twist, torque versus angle of twist variation is almost linear. But if you put some reinforcement, you get a little plastic behavior that steel will yield. We are talking of torsional reinforcement, then it will degrade, it will soften like this. If you put more, it's very good, you will have a lot of ductility and some capacity. If you put heavy reinforcement, your capacity can increase. This is, but the slope of this line remains same. This wakes up only after the first crack. This torsional steel comes to your help only after the first crack, after cracking takes place. So, Tau T by tau T max is Tu by TCR. Tu is any twisting moment. TCR is that cracking moment corresponding to tau T max. So this is assumed to vary linearly, so that's the basis for this assumption. Now we've already generated a formula. The code gives you a formula for, for TCR. If you plug in that formula and you make appropriate substitutions, 
and you you will get this term typically for beams with rectangular sections this value ranges from 0.8 to 1.15 so the code simplifies the whole thing and gives you a formula in the code you remember the torsion shear stress given as 1.6 tu by b divided by b okay. so this tu by b has the units of force so it's sometimes treated as a shear force so this is a simplified formulation given in the code and this you can treat it as kind of an equivalent shear stress which is similar to your sh shear stress uh, flexural shear stress the u by b so the code says find out this equivalent shear caused by twisting moment find out the flexural shear that you get from flexural shear and you can add these two together and that's called your equivalent shear b u plus 1.6 t u by b when you divide that by b d you get your nominal shear stress okay we studied all this, but I've given you a great explanation. I can see you're tired. So am I. <laughs> so we'll stop. Thank you.